What comes to your mind when someone says the name Johannes Gutenberg? Well, you probably think of this guy and his famous printing press, the first of its kind in Europe. After all, it's pretty much common knowledge that this machine essentially put an end to the days of us having to painstakingly write everything by hand, bringing Europe into the modern age. But what you might not know so much about is just how much this one invention completely transformed the way that we write, read, and even think. Not just physically, but rewiring our concepts of language and culture entirely. Much of how we cognitively intake and process information, you and me alike, can be traced back to the effects of what Gutenberg started more than half a century ago. In this video, I'm thus going to be discussing the consequences of Gutenberg's printing press on reading, writing, and thought, and what it says about how Europe today has come to be. And hopefully you'll learn a thing or two about how this man transformed the way that you think. Okay, but if we want to understand just how much of a genius this man was, first we've got to examine what the climate of literature was like in the years before its invention. How accessible really was literature? Who was it intended for? Now, it's a stereotype for medieval literature to have been not all that dynamic or wide-ranging in theme, and just be based mostly on religious texts. After all, the period before the Renaissance is commonly called the Dark Ages, supposedly for a lack of any real development in literature, art or anything. But this isn't actually really the case in reality. Medieval literature was pretty diverse and explored a range of different ideas and motives that we would recognise in modern literature. Things like love, honour, fame and identity. Of course, these things weren't necessarily always explored as complex or meaningfully as they would be in the future, but they were still there. And these stories got everywhere. Medieval Eurasia, contrary to popular belief, was extremely well connected, and this is very much down to the Silk Roads, those extensive trade routes spanning across Europe and Asia. A small parish church in France might have pigment in its paintings that came from India, and glass, which was particularly valuable, was transported across distances as far as Ireland to China. And stories, tales, moved very much in the same way as these material goods, travelling along trade routes and picking up bits of the local cultures along the way. Western European literature, despite gaining the spotlight in discussions about medieval texts, was connected to a complex network reaching across the entire Old World. Now, as these exchanges occurred between different cultures, it's inevitable that conflict would arise. Indeed, much literature traded across this network does focus on difference and fear of the other, but there was also more productive exchange as well. In fact, there's a pretty interesting example of a book from India documenting the travels of Siddhartha Gautama aka the Buddha, and just through being traded a bunch, it got translated into Arabic, Greek, Hebrew, German and French, and moreover even became Christianized into the story of Balaam and Josephat. So a Buddhist text became essentially localized into a holy Christian narrative. Maybe you might find it surprising, but this practice of localizing books to fit a different language, religion or culture was actually not that uncommon in medieval times. For example, the legends and romances of Alexander the Great appear in Christian, Islamic and Jewish versions, with language variants in Persian, Ethiopic, English and Slavonic. So medieval epics, songs, poetry, whatever could get written down, moved around the world along on what was essentially a network of connecting cultures. But, saying all this, 
Writing in the Middle Ages was still pretty much fundamentally restricted in a few very crucial ways, and in no way is this more apparent than by looking at the books themselves. In the Middle Ages, books had no title pages or any visually organised labels. Geoffrey Chaucer's The Parliament of Fowls, for example, ends pretty aptly. Here ends the Parliament of Fowls, held on St Valentine's Day, as recounted by Geoffrey Chaucer. Though this practice of rhetorical introduction would actually continue in a form into the 19th century. Manuscript texts were a lot bulkier, the parchment was thicker and stiffer than most paper we would recognise today, and how small or compact a writer could write it on was restricted by his quill pen. This would be a reducer in the incentive to produce books. Unless you were a monk, or else had a whole lot of money, it would be pretty hard to get a book made. It probably wasn't worth the effort. And this leads us to our second big difference between the books of today and the books of yesteryear. No two copies of the same book were physically the same. Each possessed minute differences that were exclusive to itself, even if they were supposed to be the same text. Today we recognise books by how they appear, their covers and their typefaces. If I go into a bookstore looking for this edition of Irving Finkel's book The First Ghosts, I'm going to be looking for the book with this exact cover, because it's mass produced. Similarly, each copy will have the same words printed in the same font, printed in the exact same places in each copy. These ways in which we identify a particular book is entirely a product of modern mass production printing. They simply didn't exist before then. In these times, what gave a work of writing its identity didn't have much of anything to do with how it appeared, and everything to do with what was said when someone read it out aloud. If a person could not read, and most people couldn't, they wouldn't be able to tell if two copies of the same book were indeed the same book with the same contents. To the people who could read, how the book appeared largely didn't matter, because the medieval reader probably wouldn't have even been reading the contents of his books in the first place. Most likely, he was reciting them. The practice of silent reading, as we'll discuss later on in this video, is also somewhat a product of printing. When you read something out aloud, the words you say become disassociated from the text that you originally obtained them from, but when you read silently, they don't. The words are completely under your personal control. And as we'll also discuss, this is going to show how Gutenberg's printing press, in essence, turned books from mere tools to be used for oral purposes, to an extension of the text itself. Words became tangible objects in their own right. Johannes Gutenberg started his career as a manufacturer and seller of mirrors to pilgrims, upriver in Strasbourg. However, around the 1440s, he began to experiment with a method of what's called movable type to print books. Movable type refers to using upraised letters or other figures on small blocks, which are called types. The printer will arrange the different types within a frame on the press to form words, and then print a page of writing out. The ingenuity in these types lies in the fact that they can be moved around, broken apart, and adapted to print other pages of writing. Now I know what you're thinking. Hold on, wasn't the first movable type press invented in China, not Strasbourg? Well, yes, but not quite in the same way. Let me explain. Indeed, the process of movable type printing was first developed in Song Dynasty China. The inventor Pi Sheng created ceramic types for Chinese characters in around AD 1040. However, why is Gutenberg far more well known today than Pi Sheng? Well, let's just say that Pi Sheng's movable type press didn't exactly catch on for technological reasons. For you see, unlike the alphabetic Latin script that was ubiquitous in Western Europe, the Chinese language uses tens of thousands of characters, rather than letters, 
and these characters, either alone or put together with other characters, represent different things and concepts. It simply took far too long to reproduce multiple copies of these thousands upon thousands of characters needed to make printing viable. The tried and tested method of calligraphy was simply quicker and more economical for the Chinese. Hence, the movable type printing press was not used all that much in China, and it wouldn't have been very well known by medieval Europeans consequently either. However, by 1450, Europe had all the sufficient technology needed to create a press of its own. There was paper, metal alloys, casting methods, and presses used for centuries to make wine and olive oil. Add up all of these developments and mix them together with an alphabetic-based script, which would only need to produce types for a small amount of letters, and you have all of the ingredients needed for a printing revolution. So let's get back to Gutenberg himself. Now, unfortunately, we just don't know that much about his life. We know that he came from a probably wealthy background in Mainz, which was a leading commercial port on the Rhine River. We also know that his father was an official in the town's mint, which would have produced coins for the Holy Roman Empire. So Gutenberg wasn't a nobody, he probably attended university and knew Latin, and may have also picked up his father's skill of making gold coins. At some point in his 30s, Gutenberg moved up river to Strasbourg, where he started to manufacture and sell metal mirrors to pilgrims, who would supposedly use these mirrors to capture the healing powers of relics in religious sites. Yeah, pretty weird. However, outbreaks of the bubonic plague stopped the flow of pilgrims through Strasbourg, and it's at this point that we believe Gutenberg abandoned his mirror business and began experimenting with movable type. To create his movable type press, Gutenberg used an ingenious method that he may have picked up from his father's coin making. This involved what was called a punch, a chisel that was used to engrave small lettering and design on a metal mould for casting coins. Gutenberg reworked this punch to create a mould that could cast types, using a trial and error method to figure out the right alloy to use. This new mould could mass produce reusable identical types of each letter of the Latin alphabet, plus punctuation marks. He also had to figure out the exact right thickness of paper for the ink to stick properly, and the exact pressure needed for the press to print letters from the types onto the paper. He did all of this by himself, completely unaware of the ceramic press in China. By 1450, Gutenberg had finished printing his first book, a book of Latin grammar for students. However, he had much more ambitious goals in mind for his new invention. In the mid-15th century, the Catholic Church was reaching the apex of its wealth and influence across Europe. Part of the reason was the popularity of indulgences everywhere. These were special forms which called upon Christians to donate money to the Catholic Church. When a Christian bought an indulgence, the money was given to the Church and, in return, the Church forgave any sins that the Christian might have, guaranteeing their admission into heaven. These indulgences spread like wildfire across Europe, and even Gutenberg may have caught on to the trend by printing a few indulgences of his own to sell. But that wasn't all. The Catholic Church wanted to standardise all Christian worship in Europe through uniform Latin Bibles. Gutenberg caught wind of this and, taking out a loan from a businessman, hired and trained craftsmen to construct six new printing presses, whom together would create Europe's first printing workshop. In five years time, Gutenberg's workshop had printed almost 200 Bibles. This was a miraculously fast achievement for its time. It's clear that Gutenberg was chiefly concerned not with beauty, but accuracy. If we take a look at his Bible, it's strikingly simple, consisting of two columns of print aligned at a straight edge and the left and right margins, a format that remains largely unchanged in modern books. Compare it to what other Bibles looked like in 1450, and it quickly becomes clear how big of a deal this was. The first mass-produced Bible. 
but there's something important missing here. Gutenberg had both the means and the will to mass produce text, but what for? You can print as many books as you want, but that itself won't change the fact that the number of people who will be willing, no, even able to read your books, is going to be very limited. For a revolution to happen, you need the masses. Clearly, there's a couple of sparks missing here, and one of those sparks is literacy, or a suitable distribution network in place of literacy. Literacy rates at this time were pretty abysmal, and the frequency of Latin readers, aka the learned men, a fraction of that amount. But is there a way for you to experience the contents of a text without having actually read it yourself? What if someone reads it out for you? Here's where Gutenberg's shrewdness in applying his invention comes in again. In May 1453, Constantinople was conquered by an astounding Turkish force under the command of Mehmet II, and converted into the new capital of the Islamic Ottoman Empire, an empire that threatened Christian Europe. Gutenberg took this opportunity and quickly rushed to work, printing a calendar that served as a warning to Christendom against the Turk, including monthly exhortations written in verse for European leaders to unite, starting with the Pope in January. September would call to arms, Germania, you noble German nation, and the calendar ended with the first printed New Year's greeting, wishing readers a good holy new year for 1455. In just a few years of its conception, Gutenberg's innovation in information technology was being utilised for, wait for it, propaganda. This was a big deal. Anyone who knows even basic history at least knows that the Reformation was, let's say, significant. Through movable type, the potential for influencing an audience on a scale never before seen by writing was now being recognised. And with potential comes commercialisation. And with the potential for commercialisation, this strange new technology began migrating across the continent. Twenty-one years after Gutenberg's first print run of the Bible in 1450, William Caxton, all the way over in England, was prompted to set up his own press in Westminster, publishing the Canterbury Tales, as well as 100 other works, which included chivalric romances, classical works, and English and Roman histories. Pretty varied. Other German printers travelled to Venice, where they could sell their printed texts to ship captains, a market of mass distributed goods. These ships left carrying religious texts, but also news from around the world. Printers in Venice sold news pamphlets to sailors, and when their ships landed in ports, local printers could copy these pamphlets and hand them over to riders, who would transport them to dozens of towns. Locals would gather in taverns to hear the latest news, ranging anywhere from low-level scandals to war reports radically normalising the consumption of news in everyday life, no longer excluded from the illiterate. As the historian Ada Palmer asserts, it made it normal to go check the news every day. This was all amplified by Martin Luther's Flugschriften pamphlet, using the Wittenberg Press to articulate his theological fight with the Catholic Church onto the printed word with a short and focused text that quickly captivated and motivated its reader. The demand for books expanded further yet, as religious debate engaged the interest of a new, literate and non-clerical audience. It's pretty ironic, in fact, that Gutenberg's movable type produced Bibles in numbers never seen before, and in doing so, was simultaneously able to produce many more copies of writings critical of the church than also would have ever been possible before. In a decade, the city of Wittenberg was transformed from a small publishing outpost into a pillar of the print industry. Its success in this extraordinary business operation fundamentally reshaping the world of literature and proving it to be an immeasurable force for change for the lives of millions. Over the next half century, Gutenberg's technology had diffused across all of Europe, 
Throughout the 15th century, 20 million books were made in Europe, but in the 16th century, this skyrocketed to 200 million. The prices of books fell by two thirds, and this would contribute to a certain literacy rate. From 1450 to 1550, adult literacy rates in Germany and Britain climbed from 7% to around 16, and over the forthcoming century after, this number would triple. Across this period, books fundamentally transformed both the purpose of writing and the experience of reading, doing so in both literal and conceptual senses. As Gutenberg himself said, It is a press, certainly, but a press from which shall flow in inexhaustible streams. It shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light to shine amongst men. We've already discussed the physical makeup of both pre and post print text, but now let's compare them a little more directly. The physical differences between text before and after movable type were indeed significant, but these were also intertwined with profound implications for the purpose of literature that were much more than just animal skin deep. As the historian Walter Ong argues. To recap, in preprint culture, Manuscript books had no title pages, typically catalogued by their first words in a direct address to the reader. As Ong affirms, post-Gutenberg printed texts gained a table of contents, with titles and title pages comparable to that of labels on boxes. Conversely, in previous manuscript culture, texts acted more so as proclamations. Several of Chaucer's poems conclude with an envoy, sending off his text to address itself to a speaker. For example, he explains his reasoning for writing The Parliament of Fowls from a dream that had occurred to him after writing about Scipio Africanus Major. In the pre-printing era, the word was bound to its author and the meanings they placed on it. Notions of authorship placed manuscript books therefore close to oral exchange. With printing, the word lost its physicality and allowed itself to be more personalised within the reader. But perhaps the most significant difference between pre- and post-print text was that prior, no two copies of the same work matched physically. What gave a work its identity considered little in how it appeared, but more so what was said when it was read out aloud. From the ancient Greeks to the monks of the Byzantine, for centuries and centuries, Europeans read their texts aloud. In St Augustine's Confessions, when he describes the reading habits of the Bishop of Milan, he even seems to suggest that the mere notion of reading a book silently was considered rude. I've talked about how the printing press helped turn reading into a social activity, but this was almost exclusively oral based. So how did reading culture change so drastically into the silent practice that we recognise today? Well, again, it comes down to that magic word. Commercialization. But of course, it's not that simple. Though the mass production of books made them cheaper to produce, more distributable, and more affordable, records show that as late as the mid 18th century, people who were able to read only owned a small handful of books, probably a Bible, and maybe a few other devotional works. But just 50 years later, according to the historian Robert Danton, Private reading was a much more voracious practice through the accessibility of new modes of reading like newspapers, and by the late 19th century they had branched out even further to children's literature among other types. Okay, so maybe we can't give Gutenberg all of the credit for this incredibly gradual process of universal literacy, though he sure did help make reading more accessible and normalised to a wider audience. In the beginning was the word, begins William Tyndall's St John's Gospel translation in the 1520s. In this section I'll be focusing primarily on the transformation of language through Gutenberg's press 
and how this facilitated the transformation of the purpose of books. William Caxton, with the rapid popularity of Gutenberg's press across continental Europe, had a plan. He had a plan to turn England into a nation of readers, an increasingly literate nation of intellectuals arguing about books. Yes, England, along with the rest of Western Europe, was undergoing a cultural shift, from performance to emotion, extroversion to introversion. Of course, it has to be said, serious discussions worth their salt were still expected to be expressed in Latin. Most learned men were simply used to it, and felt awkward using the vulgar tongue. Across the 16th century, over 5,000 books were published in Latin, 1,000 in German, 1,000 in Italian, almost 1,000 in French, and a further 1,000 in other languages, including 500 in English. And as far as 1605, only 58 out of 2,000 books in Oxford University's Bodleian Library were of the English language. So although Latin continued to dominate the word in discussions amongst learned men, the common tongue was steadily making texts more accessible to any common man who could read, creating an incentive to become literate. Robert Danton explains the widespread provenance of reading from men of all walks of life. For the commoner, reading became a social activity from workshops to taverns. For the educated man, reading conversely became a private experience, with small reading clubs, cabinets littres, all these, the German equivalent of which I won't attempt to pronounce. These reading clubs, Danton argues, provided a foundation for educated, middle-class, bourgeois culture in the 18th century. By 1800, one out of every 500 Germans belonged to one of these reading clubs. But let's stay focused on English. Caxton himself believed that the new written language, post-printing press, should leave the spoken language behind itself in both vocabulary and style, avoiding things like idioms and what he called vulgar colloquialism. After all, sophisticated English should use long words and complex sentences like the Latin and Greek classics did. Caxton and his semantics-obsessed contemporaries were dazzled by the perception of Latin and Greek as the educated language, as well as the elegant modernity of Romance languages like French and Italian, thinking that English should enrich itself by emulating its peer tongues. The speech of England is a base speech to other noble speeches, as Castilian and French. England saw a vernacular revolution consequently, with 89% of non-important printed scripture being of the common word. The secularisation that had been occurring across Northwest Europe reflected a cultural, emotion-driven change. Secular literature and theatre that would have massive influence on language that persists today, spurred on by dramatists like Marlowe, Johnson and Shakespeare, could finally flourish under the new, enriched English. This new, indisputably vernacular, yet Latinized English had the potential for a virtually unlimited number of purposes, to benefit the good of English society, of course. It could be used for authoritative religious instruction and the masters like Fisher and Moore, or it could conversely be used to create elegant courtly literature like Spencer's Fairy Queen and Milton's Paradise Lost, which appeals to a more educated readership. Therefore, the revolution of religion by text allowed for a revolution of the text itself to take place. Dissident ideas could spread quicker, not just among the learned man, but the common man. Through the universalization of the word, no longer an exclusivity of the elite, but a tool of society, the vernacular could claim victory over the dominance of Latin, which progressively came to be seen among religious works as an outmoded papal imposition though the use of Latin did persist among intellectuals, even Protestants. Across Western Europe, similar concentrated revolutions occurred, which led, among other factors, to the creation of the modern novel. A story didn't have to simply convey spectacle or evoke religious piety in the reader. They could present moral discourse and philosophical discussions, 
and in doing so, translate the writer's words into personal interpretation. Spain saw a literary revolution. Novels like Guzman de Alfarache in 1599, Don Quixote in 1605, and Historia de la Vida del Buscón in 1626 were intended for a sophisticated public, tasked with unlocking the meaning of the text placed in front of them. Other novels, like the anonymously published Life of Lazarillo de Tormes, were initially controversial in Catholic Spain due to their vehemently anti-clerical content, with the titular protagonist suffering a life of indenture and slavery at the hands of cruel priests and deceptive chaplains. Much of the humour and irony in Life of Lazarillo seems familiar to postmodern readers of pastiche. For example, even the name of the protagonist, who undergoes a spiritual death, directly alludes to the biblical Lazarus. Satire was a focal point in these new novels. Lazarillo's biblical parody and Don Quixote's humorous deconstruction of chivalric literature and culture served to both entertain, as medieval courtly poetry had done before, and assess, much like Martin Luther's harsh appraisal of the old religious institution which had brought Europe out of the era of authority and into a gradually modern era, where any concept, literal or abstract, could be questioned. This was the foundation of a new era of fresh, literate modes of thinking. Although the invention of the movable printing press laid the foundation for the movement towards universal literacy, it still took several generations to produce a consistent prose style free of the effect of all residue, allowing the marked decline of all based classical and religious literature during the 17th and 18th centuries. By the 19th century, 70 to 80 percent of the books in German, English, and American libraries came from the category of light fiction, 10 percent from history, biography, and travel, and less than 1 percent from religion. In just 300 years, the world of text had been lifted into a realm of greater social consciousness. Marshall McLuhan uses the phrase Gutenberg Galaxy to refer to Gutenberg's invention as an epoch in which new tools, novelties in media, or advances in technique altered and so disrupted European culture, so much so that European man was himself transformed and displaced from an ear culture to an eye culture, meaning a fundamental shift from the oral tradition of the Dark Ages to a culture centred around a worship of literacy. To be illiterate meant to be ignorant. This is a purely modern idea, and these are plentiful in Gutenberg's galaxy. New phenomena of individualism, Protestantism, nationalism, and a nuanced perspective in high art were brought to the forefront of attention in a society that was now becoming at least a little bit more recognisable as modern. But what happened to Gutenberg himself? Well, it's a little anticlimactic and a bit unfortunate, mostly for him. He died a broke man in 1468, having taken out loans to fund his printing press, loans he could never pay off. He died before William Caxton's printing shop was set up, before he could know just how significant it would be. Sometimes, fortune is unfair.